As a detective, there's no greater skill that you can hone than your intuition. If you can't trust your gut, you might as well be in parking enforcement. Holy shit. Sir, can I quit the force forever, please? I'm uh, Gene Hansen, detective with the LAPD, and coincidentally, your next door neighbor. Oh, the detective. Just busy detecting, aren't you? Got some bad news. Clearly, you're familiar with Heather Dromgrill. Heather? Heather was the victim of a murder on Thursday night. You were seeing her romantically? No, 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 no. So you guys aren't like a thing. I'm single. So you're single. He's single. She was killed via blunt force to the head. Case closed. No, not case closed. We don't have a killer. That's why you're the boss. What was your relationship with her? Was she close to you guys? Was she like family? <laughs> Tell me about last night. You may have saw or heard something that you're not even aware of. An actor's senses are so finely attuned. Like a detective. <laughs>
I love comic books. I hate comic book movies and comic book TV shows. However, Luke Cage, one of the few that has made me be thrilled. There is oh. something different about it. It's very, it's, it's very slow paced. It's very subtle. Slow paced, subtle. Steve the vibe, black culture. And the acting is so good. Yeah. It just, I just dig it, man, so much. So let's talk about how you sort of transitioned from your filmmaking before to doing a somewhat, I would say, a loose genre film. This is a right. loose genre film, but your films before were more just sort of loose character studies. Yeah, they're all, they were loose character studies. This is more of a loose genre, and now we've lost everyone who's streaming. <laughs> loose genre, loose character studies. I must go to a different page. <laughs> well, you know what I mean, man. Yeah. We're having a, by the way, I'm a big believer in always... It was something I learned at Second City. Play to the top of your intelligence. Assume the audience is as intelligent as you, if not smarter than you, and you can't go wrong. But I know sometimes when we just say the word genre, if you walk into a pitch meeting in L.A. and say the word genre, they ask you to leave immediately. Really? Yeah. I went, I went in once, and I um, hard-boiled, I've used... Get out! The John Woo film? No, the term hard boiled. Oh, the term hard. The t <laughs> or, they or, couldn't handle the term or, hard boiled. I will tell you what term really made them scared was noir. Really? Yeah, noir, but which no, this has a little bit of, but noir. You know, they didn't want any. I went in with a guy named Ed Brubaker, who's a great comic book writer, and now he's he wrote on Westworld, and now he's going to be writing a new show on Amazon. Netflix, I'm sure, is thrilled right now, but. Um, <laughs> But it's with the dude who made Drive. Oh, Nicholas Winding Road. Oh, yeah. uh, the yeah, yeah, young, too young to die, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so there'll be some noir aspects. I, but he and I went with this great idea. Noir, no. Why? It's noir is notoriously cheap to make. It's violent. It's sexy. Wait a minute. If I'm pitching to you, it's gonna happen. <laughs> if I'm pitching to you, we're gonna have a fun time. Okay. <laughs> But this is the reason you're not an executive and I'm not pitching to you. You're too... By the way, Netflix is like you. There we go, Would Netflix. You... No, <laughs> I can have this kind of conversation with Netflix about things I'm doing. I can have this kind of conversation. And there are some executives that you can, some. But for the most part, it's not... You, you can't make something like this, yeah. you know? So... Why is that, though? I mean, is that because of the genre itself? Sorry no. to use that word. Or the is it friends, because of how loose it is? It's really simple. Most television networks, and including FX and HBO, but really the, the, the main networks, they try to appeal with each individual show to the widest possible audience. It gets watered down. It doesn't have subtlety, tone, a voice. Netflix, all they need is something for everyone on Netflix. So in other words, watch this, watch Fuller House. Do you know what I mean? Like, they have all sorts of stuff for you. Watch Luke Cage. Um, so they can have shows that don't have to appeal to the widest possible audience. Everyone else kind of, even HBO wants to get the most amount of viewers. But HBO, I gotta give them credit, they want the highest possible quality. But they're still falling into that area and they note you, you know, especially when you do a pilot. Netflix, you never get notes. Never get notes. They, they didn't even come to set when I made it. Was this ever dreamed of as a pilot rather than a, a standalone movie initially? Well, what it was originally dreamed of was a stand-up comedy special. Well, I kind of feel that a lot of times stand-up comedy specials are, you know, you've seen one, you've seen them all. You've seen one comic, you've seen them all. You know, outside of like Louis C.K., Amy Schumer, Chris Rock, certain people, and John Mulaney, I'm leaving people out, so if anyone's watching. Okay. The big hitters. The big hitters. Does anyone really care? And the word special was because they were special. They were only on HBO and Showtime. They were special. They were rare. There were maybe 15, 18 of them a year. Now there's 15 or 18 of them a month. So I don't think, so I said to Ted Sarandos, uh, who runs Netflix, what if I did a stand up special that kind of was like mixed with Columbo? 
And he goes, yeah, let's do that. Well, as I started... This is the easiest place to pitch ever. Netflix, I got a lot of ideas. Let me get in your office. By the way, I do have a lot of ideas, you know. (laughs) And they've said no, too. So, all right. So I start developing it. I start writing it. I wrote it with this woman, Andrea Siegel. And as we're writing it, it's occurring to me that it would be better to be a character than Jeff Garland uh, being a private detective because uh, um, Handsome is a, is a uh, homicide detective for the police. And then I thought, well, he can't be good at stand-up. So I wrote all these scenes where he and his next-door neighbor played by, um, um, what the, f- oh, my brain. I'll guess. Christine, it. right? No, no, no. Uh, uh, um, ah! Eddie Pepitone? Eddie Pepitone. <laughs> Eddie Pepitone, <laughs> my brain. Uh, we were all, so he's a private eye. I'm a homicide detective. But we both like doing stand-up to get away from it. So I made myself not a very good stand-up. And we filmed these scenes. And I love these scenes. They didn't fit in the movie. I didn't believe it. I was like, I don't believe that. So on their own, maybe I'll show them somewhere someday. But I didn't believe it. So, so that's a whole part of this it. story that's not in the film at this point? Or yeah. was that something that you I started with and then you developed the movie after that? No, movie? I shot it. And then I cut it. I love the scenes. And I cut it because it, the movie's much better because of it not being there. My original cut when it was like almost two hours and now it's 80 minutes. Well, what's so interesting about making a sorry to use the word genre again, a loose genre film, is that yeah. even though it's loose, when you get into the editing of it, you, act, you, you end up realizing again that it has to be somewhat taught and you have to follow well, No, it has plot. to be structured. I mean, for me, not other filmmakers, I'm just saying there has to be... Look, Groucho Marx many years ago went to see Second City in Chicago, which is my theater company. And uh, after the show, they said, Groucho, what'd you think? And Groucho said, make it shorter, make it funnier. So when I'm in editing, I'm trying to make it shorter and make it funnier. The first rule is always make them want more, right? Well, that, you always make, make, that's an audience thing. Make them want more. You know, if I leave right now, you're like, oh, he's a nice guy. If I leave when we're done, eh, maybe I like him. If I leave three hours from now, why did he do that to us? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I would enjoy less that because I'd be enjoying it. Well, that. as an acting style, my acting style is less is more. Don't, I mean, there's nothing better than someone on the verge of crying or on the, ver- like, teetering on sadness, melancholy. I love that. But, you know, less is more for me, including the movie. Um, all my movies now have been around 80 minutes. I like that. There's something uh, interesting to the flip side of less is more, though, when it comes to comedy, because some, sometimes when you do even more, it can be funny. Like a person crying for two and a half hours on its own is, is kind of Where funny as well. Where are you going well. to see that? Someone who's just crying for well, an excessive way, period of no, time. No, but let's do an example of a great joke in terms of making it excessive. But You do one in here. What's that? You do this ex- excessively long pause oh, between staring. you and the lieutenant yeah, staring. Yeah, it was real. Lieutenant Joe Kenda. Does anyone here watch Homicide Hunter? Not many of you watch it. It's on, <laughs> it's on I, I, ID, ID the, Crime. The greatest cable channel there is. Awesome. Yeah. So there's a show in there called Homicide Hunter starring this gentleman. Well, not starring. He, he narrates it. There's like a young guy who plays him. His name is Joe Kenda. And he's very, hello, I'm Joe Kenda. It's <laughs> You know, I, 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 I knew it in my heart. This is a bad guy. <laughs> so I hired him to be in the movie. And we have a conversation. Yes. So I'll tell you another scene in a different movie. Same thing. Uh, dead, men don't wear, dead, dead Men Don't Wear Plaid with Steve Martin, directed by Carl Reiner. There's a moment in the movie where he's filling a coffee thing. And he's going like this. The sound of the coffee going in. And he keeps going for like two minutes. Awesome. Awesome. That doesn't go against the rule of less is more. That's just a, that joke is actually the proper length for what it's supposed to be. Right. That's all. Let's talk about uh, casting Handsome, like Natasha Leone. She's incredibly funny. I wrote the part for her. Did you really? I wrote the part for everyone. Um... And so, yeah, I just called them and said, I wrote this. Are you available? Steven Weber? 
Yeah, uh, yes. What made you cast Steven Weber or want to write something for him? Well, first off, I didn't write the part for Steven Weber. But when Allison Jones and I, who was the casting director, started discussing Steven Weber, it was like, why would we ever think of anyone else? And to me, I, I think everyone, I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud of this movie. Yeah. Um, it's the best thing that I've ever done. I don't know if you'll like it, but it's the best thing I've ever done. Um, Why do you say that? How dare I say, you're going to love it. It's the best movie ever made. No, no. What you think of me is none of my business. That's why I won't even read my reviews. You know, I love that you told me you dig it. That makes me very happy. And then I, I'll take that every day and say thank you. But I know I made the movie I wanted to make. I made the movie that... I feel is the best that I can do, but people may hate it. I don't know. I, I can't say it. I'm hopeful that people, I do think if people enjoy watching you on this show, they probably like it. No, I say that because <laughs> you're a, an intelligent man. You're very good at what you do. So it seems to me that you come on here and have conversations with your guests and it's, something that's really good, I think people will dig my movie. But I can't, I mean, the, the people means everyone. Yeah. So I can't assume. I would assume if they dig you and dig the show, they'll dig that. I think so. I yeah. think so. But I'm just curious if you feel like it's your best one, if that has anything to do with the feeling of completing something that fits within a sort of tighter structure than, than your previous films. If there's something about the structure of a genre that suddenly feels more no, like I you accomplished. I, I literally just go into the editing bay with my editor and edit. There's no thought process to this, anything. <laughs> this works, this doesn't work. I don't feel good here. I feel good here. This is a nice moment. This is not a nice moment. I mean, I say nice. I'm not talking about nice. I'm talking about like works. And I just cut the best movie I can with no process to what movies I've made before or anything. Maybe when I'm 90 and there's a film festival honoring me, which I wish. No, I don't. I'd rather nap. But the point <laughs> being is if that does happen... Then I'll look at my work and I'll go, oh, I didn't notice that. That I try not to, like, I don't think about myself as a stand-up, like, in terms of, of uh, how I do it, ever. Same with filmmaking. Now, your previous films, or at least the, the last film you, you made, Dealing with, uh, Dealing with Idiots, right? That yeah. was almost entirely improvised, correct? correct Dealing correct? with Idiots was entirely improvised, this? not almost. This 2% was improvised. Wow. Because I wrote, here's the thing, when you can make a movie and uh, the script, you're really proud of the script. I love the script. I think the script is great, I'll say that, but only because Andrea Siegel wrote it with me and she made it great, okay? How did you come across Andrea Siegel? How did the two of you start collaborating? She wrote a movie that I was in earlier called Laggies that Lynn Shelton made. And so we met at the Q&A for the movie, you know, when we showed the movie. And I just fell in love with her. And it was so such a rewarding writing relationship. And I wrote another I wrote a pilot with her just recently. What was the writing relationship like? What was the process like? Sharing stuff over email? Getting together? No, that's a bunch of... I can't do that. We sat in a specific coffee shop, Jones on 3rd in Studio City. We sat there every day for a, for a few weeks and only talked about the story, the story, the story, the story. That is like, so much fun. Beat the crap out of the story. So much fun. Then she, and by the way, God bless her for doing this, she goes and writes the first draft. Then I rewrite the second draft. Then we together go over the whole movie. And that's how we did it. That sounds incredibly fulfilling. As so a process. So fulfilling. And making, it was all, the whole process working for Netflix, there was not a moment in this that I didn't have joy. Did you feel like you were stretching your filmmaking muscles doing Again, this? Again, 
I don't think about that. I just go out there and I make a movie. You're not on set and you're not thinking like, oh, this feels different than the way I shot the last no, movie or anything never. like that? I don't think about anything, man, except, <laughs> no, I read the paper every day. I read the How New York Times. What are you doing Times, with that? Well, New York Times and Washington Post. Doesn't mean I don't, I don't want to read other viewpoints, which I do on the internet, per se. Freak out like I do? <laughs> no. Here's what I do, man. So I'm home and things are getting to me. I go outside and I look at a tree. Really? Yeah. And if there's a breeze, even better. When Trump takes away breezes, then I got a problem. <laughs> Is that. <laughs> That's 100% true. Would you call that your, for, your sort of personal form of meditation? Yeah, I, I actually do meditation. I do TM, and I also do that. It's just, what it is is just being in a moment with something that's truly real. Not that what the government's doing isn't real, but it's, everything's with a spin, and everything is partisan. So, by the way, uh, liberals make me just as nuts. I mean, left-wing people make me just as nuts as, nuts as right-wing people. I don't like moderates either. I like, I like people who are liberal-minded, which means all of it's fine. You know, I'll vote for, I'm, I'm liberal, I'd vote for a Republican for president if it was a more thoughtful person than the person who's running on the Democratic side. It's all based on who's good for humanity. So I'm an independent voter. Um, and so for me, there's no party line. There's no partisan. There's just like, is this good for human beings? Is this good for the world? That's the way I look at everything. And you know what's good for a world? A breeze with a, a nice tree. And so I go experience something that's good for the world. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. How does that... There's a lot of challenges on a, on, a, on a set when you're directing a movie. Do you find yourself looking at a tree for a breeze when you're, when you're making a movie? Or do you not really, do you not feel confronted with challenges that a lot of directors There are feel? challenges, but they come with the job. And I love them. And I do look at trees and feel the breeze while I'm directing. I'm, I, I would be apt to even say sometimes, hey, give me a minute. I walk away and look at a tree. Really? Yeah. Or the grass if it's nice. No, I just, I'm always present. I try to always be present. And to me, when you sign on to be a director, things happen. And I don't lose my temper. You've never lost your temper while directing? Once. No, but listen, what it is, it's so stupid. One of our trucks kept on going in reverse, which makes this loud beeping noise. And I'm like, oh, could somebody get that? All right, is anyone going to get that? It's beeping! Make it stop beeping! That was me losing my temper. That's not that bad at all. So, but I, I consider that losing my temper. Um, there's nothing more than that. No, I never, I, I'm always, I told um, uh, um, Christine Woods, who plays my other next door neighbor, I said, if this isn't the most fun and rewarding experience, and you don't feel the most involved when making a movie, I failed. And so she came on days she wasn't shooting. She just hung out because it's not like I create a party. That's bullshit. I, um, I create an atmosphere that is delightful. Right. I try, and it's, by the way, those attitudes, no matter where you work, corporation, McDonald's, doesn't matter. Whoever the main manager is, the main boss, all comes down from then. So if I'm pleasant every day and I'm happy to be there, that sets a tone. Is there, is there also a part of you that, you know, you have a fairly successful career at this moment? Like you wouldn't direct a movie if you couldn't, if it didn't feel like it would be delightful while you were doing it? Most definitely. Never. <laughs> Screw that. I'd rather be a waiter in a fine restaurant than, uh, which by the way, a great job if you dig it. I don't dig it. <laughs> Um, that's not something I want to do, but I'd rather do that than make a stupid... Don't offend the waiters in fine restaurants no, around your place. The, but, 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 no, I'm just saying I wouldn't want to be a waiter. In a, but they make some good money. I'm just saying if I, need, if I need to make money to survive, I'd rather have a job that I can get behind than making crap. Right. Yeah. What? I, you, when I was younger, I would sign on to movies like, oh, it's only a week. It's $100,000 for the week. It's $200,000 for the week. Where do I sign? 
and then you do it, and it sucks, and it's not fun, and they always have to do a reshoot. Always a reshoot. So it ends up being three weeks instead of one week. And then the movie's out and everyone hates it. And it's like, why? Do you have a, do you, do you have a specific movie that you remember? I mean, if, maybe if you don't want to name names or anything. I don't want to say anything. But do you remember? Like, By what, the way, IMDB is available. What was, ba but what was bad about the experience? I, I, I remember, I just remember one of them. The director, uh, myself and the star of the movie went up to this big budget movie went up to the director and said, this scene kind of doesn't make sense because of this and this. We both felt that. His response wasn't, oh, I see that, or, oh, I disagree with you. All right? You have to respect the director. No, it was. I swear, this is verbatim. Well, the studio paid a lot of money for that scene. In other words, we ain't changing it. It's locked in. The studio likes it. Done. So I'm not taking responsibility for that scene, but you guys are going to be on screen doing it, basically. Well, the, yeah, he's saying screw you and get out of my face. <laughs> and so, yeah, that happened a few times. One time a director said to me, you know, this isn't Curb Your Enthusiasm. And my response was, I know. <laughs> oh, I know. Speaking of which, uh, you guys are coming back for a new season. Is that true? I believe, yes. <laughs> yes. We're 99% done filming it. It's my favorite season yet, and it should be, I hear rumor, October. October? Yeah. Wow. What's it been, like six, seven years since then? Five years. Five years? Yeah. So when you guys are uh, sort of apart for five years and you come back together, is it really easy to get well, it all back? Here's the thing. My first scene up is with J.B. Smoove and Larry David, and we're doing the scene, and it felt like we shot last week. But Larry David's a close friend of mine. I see him. J.B. Smoove is a close friend of mine. I see him. I've seen them both plenty in five years. So it's not strange standing there with them. And like I said, it feels like we did it last week. All normal. I can separate friendship from a professional thing. But Susie Essman, Cheryl Hines, Larry David, these are all friends of mine. You know, and so... Um, I love them, so I'm not separated from them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before I turn to audience questions, a uh, quick question about the Goldbergs. Uh, yeah. Thank you. The show has done so many homages at this point to yes. movies of the 80s, and uh, do you have a favorite one? That we've shot? That you have been a part of, a, a movie homage that you've been a part I of. I don't pay attention. No, no, seriously. I a, when I came up with that question, I was almost positive that that was going to be your well, answer. The, thing. the only thing I notice is when I go in my trailer this morning, so, some mornings, there's the, the tidy whities laying out. And I'm like, oh, I'm in my tidy whities all day. <laughs> That's the only thing I notice. Other than that, it's my job to tell Adam Goldberg's story, so I just do the best that I can, and I don't have any strong opinions uh, about it, you know. Even the music that we play, not my kind of music, you know. I would play, you know, Prince or or uh, The Clash or, you know, um, something different which related to me. And the tone would be different, but that's not my job. My job is to help Adam Goldberg make the sh best show he can by doing my job. And I take it very seriously, and I have a ball. And also, the cast on that show, they're my friends, and I love them. The crew is the same crew that shot Handsome. The people that shoot the Goldbergs shot Handsome, and it was great. Did you do uh, that? Were you like on the set of the Goldbergs and were like, hey, guys, I'm making a movie. You want to come do this with me? No, it wasn't like that. It was, hey, guys, I'm making a movie. Please come do this with me. Please. Once I got my DP, Jason, in, um, and my AD, Ryan, all of it fell, fell in with the right people. Yeah. What was your shooting schedule on Handsome? I shoot really fast. So they generally give me too much time. For example, start shooting around 7, 8 o'clock, and be done around 6. And I'm usually done before lunch. A couple weeks? No, no, I'm done before lunch every day. And it oh. takes me... Wait, what? No, my shooting day doesn't go till 6. It does sometimes, but in general, I'm done before lunch, or lunch will be at 1, and I'll say let's push lunch to 2 so we can get this done. Because if I have it, I'm the director. I trust my gut. And I also edit in my head. If I have what I need, I move on. 
I don't overcover it. I don't, I don't intentionally protect myself. Sometimes my AD will say, that's associate director, assistant director. He'll say, you need to get an insert of the hand. Or I think we need to shoot that wide one more time. I'll do it. But in general, I don't. So I think I was allotted 20, 21 days, and I finished in 18 days. Wow. <laughs> and and stop at lunch. Yeah, but I, I'm not... I'm not doing it to win a competition, world's fastest film. But you could. <laughs> but my thing is, I made the movie I wanted. If I could go back and have an extra three hours every day, nothing in this movie would have changed. Nothing in this movie would be better if I had that extra time. Just the way I work, man. That's all. Yeah. You know? Let's get some uh, questions here from uh, you guys right here. Hey, Jeff. Uh, that was set up in advance. <laughs> he stood with the microphone. <laughs> By the way, you stood with two hands. You must have a nice core. Uh, sort of. <laughs> I work out sometimes. Yeah. All right, go ahead. <laughs> um, I'm such a huge fan of the Goldbergs. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, there's a, like, if you got an opportunity to maybe direct an episode. I don't want to direct an episode because it's not mine. It's not my thing. Because if I wanted to direct an episode, it'd be more of an ego thing. I'm the director. But it's Adam Goldberg's show. We have great directors. Um, I do my own stuff. So I don't want to direct it. I'm happy just acting on it. I'm not even a producer. I just act on the Goldbergs, and I dig it that way. Next question. Hi, Jeff. Um, Hi. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about working with Larry David. I will. But do all of you have microphones in advance? <laughs> Or is it per section? <laughs> so weird. You stood up, man. You know. But you're one-handed. You may not do Pilates. I don't know. <laughs> All right. You went one-handed. Well, what if she was just one-handed? All right. Um, You'd feel really bad. <laughs> well, by the way, as a stand-up, sometimes it happens that you go, you know, what are you, deaf? And, yeah. You know, what are you, blind? That's happened to me. Oh, duh. and I don't say it in a mean way. Thank God. But you know what I do after that? I dive into it. I get into it and talk about it. There was a woman who, I was performing in Austin in this theater. There's a woman having terrible trouble coming up the side. And I said, uh, did you in injure yourself? She's coming forward. She goes, no, I have Lou Gehrig's disease. Now normally, and by the way, should have been a show killer. Instead, I spent 15 minutes talking to her about her life. And I found funny things. Her husband was already seated. I laid into him, man. <laughs> Like, how do you not wait? <laughs> Come on! Lou Gehrig's disease! <laughs> who are you? That's what I said to the guy. You need to look in the mirror and ask who you are. <laughs> but, so you wanted me to talk about more about my and Larry's relationship, Larry and my relationship. Well, first off, we're great friends. Uh, he has taught me everything that I know about comedy, I think. I mean, I, I shouldn't say that. But he's made me a million times better a comedic person, comedic mind, than I could have ever dreamed of being. Where did you guys first meet? We met in New York in the 80s doing stand-up. We were acquaintances, um, uh, you know, which is a word I like to use. People throw friends around fast. We didn't become really friends until we started working together. On but, Curb? On Curb. But we had a chemistry from the very first hour special of Curb when we were auditioning people and we are doing scenes with them where he and I were like, have we worked together for like 40 years? This is weird. So right away, we, and two things I'll tell you. Number one is, quite often we don't even know what the scene's about. And they'll be rolling and we're like, what do we do? That's why it feels so fresh. Then when we, we're told it's about this, we go, oh, okay. Not always, every once in a while. But here's the thing that we do all day. We laugh all day. I don't laugh much in the scene. He breaks pretty easy. Um, so if you watch the show, watch for it to cut like a little bit too quick because he's about to laugh. Um, you can use your imagination. That's so crazy. I've heard that he's really hard to make laugh. Well, yes, if you're not funny. <laughs> That's a, we're going to have to go back on the tape to see who said that on the stage. Okay. <laughs> No, he, he laughs at anything and anyone that's funny. He's a generous laugher. But me, I won't laugh at anything that's not funny. You gotta be funny. You don't have to be a funny person, a funny moment, funny, you know, 
funny. But, you know, come on, man. And I got, I got no time to laugh at stuff that's not funny. That's why I don't watch a lot of comedy TV or comedy movies, because most of them, not only do I not think they're funny, they get me angry and upset, you know? Because I, I watch like things like Better Call Saul, which has a lot of humor in it. The Americans. Like, that's the stuff I love watching. Because that, that, I get caught up in that. But comedy, I'm taken out of it. Like, why'd they do that? You know? It's like a musical sometimes. Like, why right. are they singing in the middle of this dramatic moment? Or so like- Larry and I laugh all day. But we take the scene seriously. We work hard. But it's so joyful. And I love the guy. And also, he's one of my few close confidants. He knows everything about me. I go to him about stuff. Is this water here? That's water, yeah. yeah. I think I have time for one more question. Uh, right there. Hi, um, I'm wondering who you're... Wait a second. <laughs> She's standing. I thought, I swear, I saw you at the microphone, and I thought you were the person who hands people the microphone. No. I think she's doing both. Okay, go ahead. Multi-talented. Um, I'm wondering what your acting influences are, or who your acting influences are. Okay. There are many great actors that I love, many great comedians that I love that are in me, but I have one acting influence and it's something one of my favorite actors of all time said and that's what I follow and his name uh, was Spencer Tracy Spencer Tracy was one of the greatest actors ever and Spencer Tracy when asked about how he approaches acting he said know your lines and don't bump into the furniture (laughs) and that's what I do I know my lines I know where I'm standing. I don't. Bu- Actually, I'm, I do bump into the furniture on occasion because of just the way I am. But that's really, don't think about it. Just say it, do it, be it. You're there. That's the way I approach it. And I curb your enthusiasm. Just don't bump into the furniture because there's no lines. You're just making them up. So there's nothing to know. So that, there I don't bump into it that often because it's just one thing to focus on. Did it take you a long time to get used to the process of Curb Your Enthusiasm? Or were you already, I mean, coming from Second City, could you just sort of riff like that? The idea for Curb Your Enthusiasm was mine. I went to Larry with it. And I wasn't even supposed to be in it. God bless him for saying to me, no, you're going to play my manager. That never crossed my mind. And then he, he said, you'll be executive producer, which at the time I didn't know in TV is better than directing. So I was just going to be behind the scenes. And I was just approaching a genius with an idea. And then it ran and turned into this thing. So there was nothing to get used to. Other people needed to get used to it. It's what I did, you know. My stand-up is all improvised. Everything I do is improvised unless I write a script. And then i got to learn the lines and not bump in the furniture. Jeff Garland, everybody. Handsome is on Netflix right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you.